TT and T had obsolete teletypewriters, TTYs used for news feeds that they wanted to discard to the deaf community. Alexander Graham Bell himself was a teacher of the deaf. He wanted to develop something to help deaf people hear. So he got involved in sound research to develop a hearing aid. But he made a big mistake. He invented the telephone instead. Why a mistake? The telephone became a big obstacle for deaf people. Hearing people became more dependent on the telephone for everything. Deaf people couldn't. Often, deaf people applied for jobs, and hearing people would ask, can you use a telephone? They would say no, and it was bye-bye. Also, when deaf people enter any room, they see things they can use, such as chairs, tables, and blackboards. But when they see a telephone, they tell themselves, I can't use it. It reminds me I am deaf and I can't use the telephone. My mother and father told me to go upstairs to one apartment to make calls. The next time I would go upstairs to another apartment to make calls. There was no privacy. Did they talk to each other about us? Did they know all of our personal details, including bank information? I wouldn't be surprised if they told each other about my parents. That was part of our growing up. We had no choice but to accept it. My mom didn't like to make plans for me. I asked her if she wouldn't mind making calls for me to make plans. She would say, later, later. I had a health problem, groin problem. No TTY. I went next door where an older woman was. I asked, would you mind calling to make an appointment with my doctor? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to, to tell them I had a health issue and would like to make an appointment. The nurse said, I must know what the health issue is, or I will not make the appointment. I felt awkward, especially because of the older woman. I was forced to say, I have a groin issue. I grew up uh, as the telephone for my parents when I was very small. It wasn't ideal, and as I grew up, it became more complicated because I had to come home after school immediately to, uh, to answer the phone. I don't recall how old, maybe I was four or five years old when I first started to do that. And I remembered some awkward phone conversations with insurance agents and, and people, doctors and people like that. I uh, kind of resented it at times in the moment. My friends are going outside playing, but I can't. And my father had this line, just a few more, just a few more, he would say. We had a cup of dimes for me to make calls for my mother and father. We lived in row houses. Every time my mother or father needed to make calls to stores or to order cabs, I entered the kitchen to take a dime out of the cup, went next door, and asked a neighbor if I could use the phone. If yes, I gave a dime. At that time, we had to pay a dime for each call. After the call, 
I brought the message home. Sometimes my parents asked me to make another call to get more information. I had to get a dime from the cup again and go next door to make another call. Robert Whitebreck grew up deaf, an oralist, nerd, and lived alone in the hearing world. He studied physics. He invented TTYs for radios as he was a ham radio enthusiast. Jim Marsters, a deaf dentist in the Los Angeles area, heard about him because they both had pilot licenses. He wanted to meet him. He flew to the San Francisco area to meet him in his home to compare pilot notes. He noticed the TTY in Bob's radio room. What's that? Bob explained it was for radios. Jim asked if he could make it compatible with telephones. Sure, it can be done. Two weeks later, Jim came up and found the system ready with a reconfigured modem. It worked. Jim contacted Andrew Sachs, also deaf, whose goal was to invent a telephone for deaf people. He went to college to get a degree in electrical engineering. The three got together and formed a company called Applied Communications Corp, APCOM. They manufactured phone-type modems to work with TTYs. Latham and Nancy Brunig of the A.G. Bell Association for the Deaf and Jess Smith of the National Association of the Deaf, NAD, founded Telecommunications for the Deaf, Inc., TDI, in 1968. Back then, its purpose was to solicit volunteers and train them to recondition and distribute TTYs. TDI was able to get TTYs from AT&T. But how to get them? AT&T wouldn't deliver them. Latham and Nancy Brunig and Jess Smith got together coordinated and recruited deaf volunteers to drive to different AT&T sites all over the U.S. They picked up the machines, searched for locations to store them, and trained deaf people how to recondition the TTYs to be compatible with modems. Paul Taylor, Robert Whitebrick, and volunteers produced a homemade manual, the Red Book, to train volunteers how to recondition TTY models. Now, thank you, Whitebrick. That part of the market is that many because we are the people. And Bob Whitebrook is that we from California to Oregon. They set up a room in a motel for one week. I took in some machine, took them apart, used the camera, took pictures of each machine part, and then they wrote notes that I was a tactic, that was free computer, so I had to type right. So I would type up the notes. 
to accompany the picture. Do you like that? Picture. Was it not? Lee Brody in New Jersey, near New York City, noticed Apcom was selling the phone type for $275, and the price was increasing. He felt there was a need for competition. Also, it appeared Apcom was not producing enough to meet the demand. He decided to work with an engineer and developed a new modem called ESCO for $199. This competition caused APCOM to reduce its price. Lee noticed the need for volunteers in the New York City area. He formed New York, New Jersey Telephone TTY, where volunteers got together. My father was one of them. They got together, reconditioned TTYs. Lee Brody had a big factory where he stored several thousand TTYs and had them renovated and distributed all over New York City metro area in New England. I would go up there every day and have instructions to rewire, refurbish all of these donated big monster machines to uh, then distribute to deaf people with the, the old fashioned wooden couplers and all of that. It was the first batch of TTYs to hit the New York City area, if I'm not mistaken. And they would come in and I would work on them. I had these. Uh, basically like mimeographed, photocopied instructions from Bob Whitebrecht out in California. My father asked me to help him deliver TTYs to deaf people's homes at 7 a.m. to catch them. We tended to bring coffee. My father would knock on the door, ring the bell, or slide paper under the door. They would ask why we were so early. It is the best time to catch you before you leave. TTYs were really heavy. They had ribbons with yellow paper that rolled up. I asked, how are we going to bring them to New Orleans? He said, well, let me work on that. And then he contacted friends of his in the Pioneers Club. That's retired phone company workers. And they were very enthused to help. So they paid to rent a truck in Allentown, Pennsylvania. They themselves loaded up on the TTYs on the truck, brought it to a train, and they filled one train car with it, and they brought it to New Orleans. And then in New Orleans, they themselves paid for a big truck to bring them to my house. I lived at that time in a two-story house. The first floor was empty, parking cars, working and all. So we stored the TTYs down there. A few of the TTYs I brought to the deaf center. And behind the deaf center, I had an empty green house. So we put them in there. My father installed different TTYs in different deaf people's houses with Lee Brody. Sometimes I helped my father. The machines were so big and heavy, he couldn't carry them up four or five stories. There were no elevators. Imagine carrying those big machines weighing about 50 or 60 pounds each. No one person could carry them alone. You needed two persons. So I helped my father install them in deaf apartments in different places, not just TTYs. 
Sometimes we installed doorbell lights and phone ringing lights using hardwire. In apartments, we installed wires from one end to the other end. Some deaf people offered to pay my father, but he didn't want to accept payment. Um, I was uh, to go to her house to pick up 50 uh, Russian Union to the wire machine. I went there and met Robert Lackenau. And um, he was very kind to help me to um, load all the 50 machines on a um, rental uh, pickup uh, truck. When we finished, I was ready to leave. I got to the truck, tried to tell the car back and go further because the truck didn't have, all, it was a shift, not automatic. I didn't know how to shift, so I had to ask for to teach me how to use the shift thing. It took me 10 hours to have all the way from Ohio to home, our home in Maryland. There was one man in St. Louis named Paul Taylor. He always wanted telephone for deaf people. He heard about TTYs and got involved with TDI. Got volunteers together and created... a TTY network in the St. Louis area. Also, he set up an answering service, which today is called Relay Services. He also created a news network and had news updated weekly using the TTY loop system. People could call in to get updates. That was in the 1960s. Remember, there were no captions on TV at that time. Relay services are telecommunication services between voice and text or video-based devices that enable communications between hearing and deaf or hard of hearing individuals. TDI noticed there were many deaf people with TTYs all over the U.S. They had their own TTY numbers. They couldn't print TTY numbers in the regular hearing white pages. So TDI published its TTY directory. We called it the Blue Book. With listings of TTY numbers all over the U.S. So they could call each other. Lee Brody also had a passion to find a solution for deafblind people. He got engineers together and developed Telebraille so that deafblind people could communicate using Braille and TTY together. Wait. 
The TTY machines weighed about 200 pounds. The distribution of TTYs was about to end. AT&T had distributed all their TTYs and had none left to give away. There was a need for more TTYs, but none were available. Companies started to make portable TTYs. We called them TDDs, Telecommunications Device for the Deaf. About 25 companies got involved. Different companies made different designs. They weren't cheap, at least about $500. That was in about 1975. Um, it was 1971. Yeah. Um, so in the year we went to um, an AD uh, conference to show the, in Russia, to show the uh, MCM. But when I saw a big sign saying, showing two cups with hand uh, terminal, when I was 50 dollars, MCM 650. I went to where the booth that shows the VIP. There, I saw a man named Rob Anikaki. And uh, it just dawned on me that, gee, it seems like one ought to be able to put together a TTY that wasn't, didn't weigh 250 pounds and was all mechanical. Why don't we do it electronically? And maybe we could make it a lot smaller. So, uh, and less expensive, of course, too, because there were a few electronic gadgets around at the time, but they were all very expensive, sometimes as much as $1,000. First, we learned right away that you are much more uh, successful in designing a product if you listen to the consumer and what the consumer is really looking for. And I think the second key to the success of the organization is including the community as part of our organization. Rob Engelke came to me often. He asked me for ideas. He asked me what I thought. We gave each other ideas to modify TDDs. He was very open to us deaf people's views on things. That explains how he was successful. He always welcomed feedback from deaf people. We had relay services using TTYs. TTYs were nice, but the speed was limited to about 60 words per minute typed. Ed Boston around 1998 decided to use video
technology called VRS, Video Relay Services, that could communicate at a higher speed of about 200 words per minute, which is as fast as hearing people speak. Ed Bossen started a new era. During the trial in 1995 in Austin, I had a computer and had to get a web camera. which was about $2,500. The camera was snapped on top at the front of the computer facing me. You need to remember, at that time, there were no built-in cameras. Computers were big at that time. We had to rig it to make it work. At that time, computers were not designed for video relay purpose. It was interesting to see how web cameras evolved over the years. I am the mother of four children. When my children were small, whenever they got sick or were in accidents, I hated to bother my neighbor. I always felt very uncomfortable, but I must because of my children. Emergencies come first. Enough is enough. I am so grateful today. Technology made things easier. I now feel, as a mother, 100% independent.